Letters from Whitechapel, how to set up and play. So to set up the game, lay out the game board, set one of the Jack the Ripper pawns on the first night. The game will be played over four rounds that correspond to the four nights of murders in Whitechapel in London by Jack the Ripper. Uh, the four nights are all nights in 1888. The first one is August 31st, then September 8th, then September 30th, where two murders took place in the same night, and finally the fourth night is November 9th. Also place the second uh, Jack the Ripper pawn close to the Roman numeral one here, along with the time of the killing, red marker, Shuffle all the detective tiles and lay them here. You can lay out the rest of the game components. We'll cover those as we go through each of the phases. And the final step of setup is the Jack the Ripper player will indicate their starting hideout. They're allowed to select any numbered circle on the board except for any of the red circles. So I've done that here. This is hidden to all players. This is Jack the Ripper's hideout, and you can see it corresponds to that numbered circle on the board. Each of the four rounds, or four nights, follows this sequence of play on the player aid, so we'll go through this in depth now. So the very first step is preparing the scene. So Jack will collect the special movement tokens, and if you look at Jack's player screen, it indicates right there, based on round one, he'll get three coach tokens and two alley tokens. So he'll just take these from the supply. You'll see on the last night of the last round of the game, he only gets one of each. But since this is the first round, he'll get three and two behind his screen for use during this round. The second step, the targets are identified. So Jack will place the women tokens face down on the red numbered circle. So these are the women tokens. These represent women in London um, that he's targeting for murder. You always use red tokens equal to the number of remaining victims in the game. So since we're in round one, we have one, two, three, four, five, those white pawns. There were five murders um, in 1888. So we would use all five red markers in round one, and we always use the three decoys. If this was the last round of the game, there's only one murder victim left, so we would only actually use one red and three white. The red ones are called the mark tokens. These, these are the ones of particular interest to Jack the Ripper. So these will all get placed face down on the red circle, numbered circles, and it's Jack's choice where he decides to place the marked ones and where he decides to place the blank ones. So I've placed those on the board face down. Now the police have a sense for the different targets uh, that Jack is looking at. So now we go to step three, and that's patrolling the streets. So the actual head of the investigation places the police patrol tokens. We determine the head of the investigation each round by flipping over the top tile. So in this round, the brown detect or the brown player will be the detective this round or the head investigator. So this player, now if you're playing with fewer than five detectives, then multiple players will control different police officers. But this player will now make the decisions on where to patrol the streets. So on the first night of the game, he's going to place all seven of the police tokens. You can see five of them correspond to a colored police officer, and these are just generic patrolling officers. He's going to place these face down strategically where he thinks he wants to have a police presence in London. So the head of the investigation has placed these throughout London. They have to be placed on a black square with a yellow border. There are seven of those in the game. Now, from the second night on, a couple things will change. Uh, the first thing is when Jack places these white things, the only restriction is he can't place them on a 
scene of the crime token. So we're gonna place this later in the phase. That's where a murder actually took place. So he couldn't also place one on top of those one on top of one of those red discs. And then from night two on, the police, they've got to place five of those black markers where their policemen pawns ended the previous night. So these markers, these pawns will move across the board during the next phase. And wherever those end from the previous round, a black marker has to go on each of those spots. Now you can decide which black markers go on those, um, but they have to occupy those spots. And then the two extras can be placed freely on one of the blacks, uh, yellow outlined black squares. So Jack has identified his targets. The policemen have patrolled the streets and placed their black markers. Now step four, uh, Jack chooses his victim. Basically he's just gonna, the women, women token red markers are all replaced with the wretched pawns. So he's gonna flip over all of the white markers and any of the ones with red will get replaced with one of these. So I flipped over all the women markers and any of the ones that were marked I've now replaced with a pawn and all these can now get removed from the board. One of the things you can do now to make sure that you always use the right number of marked uh, women tokens is to actually remove one from the game now and that'll just always keep your count straight. But keep in mind on night three there's going to be a double murder so you'd have to remove an extra one there, but we'll talk about that. The last thing we do when we flip over all the white tokens, we'll put the time of the crime token on Roman numeral one. Now Jack is gonna have a choice. He can decide, Jack chooses between killing or waiting. So if he kills, we go straight to step eight. If, we, if he waits, we go to step six. So for this example, let's assume he waits and we go to step six. One thing to keep in mind, you'll see each time he waits, this marker is gonna move back one. If that marker is on Roman numeral five, he's forced to uh, commit his murder. So if Jack decides to wait, we move to step six, suspense grows, the time of crime token is moved and each of the wretched pawns uh, moves. So the first thing we do is to indicate that Jack decided to wait, and now the head of the investigation is going to move each of the wretched pawns on the board, the white pawns. The pawns can move along dotted lines to an adjacent, unoccupied, numbered circle. Um, each cannot stop adjacent to a police patrol token, they can't cross a police patrol token, and they can't stop in a circle with a crime scene marker. If a wretched pawn has no legal moves, it has to stay in its current circle. Now keep in mind, these wretched pawns represent prostitutes in London. So while they're obviously scared of Jack the Ripper, they also do not want to interact with police. So that's why they can't cross through a police marker or stop adjacent to a police marker. They could move there because that would not be adjacent to a police marker. This would be legal because a police marker is not there. If a police marker was there on that black square, that would be directly adjacent. But since the adjacent black square is empty, a pawn, a wretched pawn could be moved there. They have to move to an adjacent numbered circle. They ignore the black squares, so this pawn could mo get moved all the way over there since that's adjacent along this path. Likewise, it could move to that spot. So the head of the investigation is gonna move each of the white pawns. Strategically, what you're trying to do is get the white pawns closer to your police patrol, obviously without crossing or getting directly adjacent to them, so they're in better positions. In step seven, uh, Jack is getting ready to kill. He gets to reveal one of the police patrol tokens. So he can decide any black token on the board. Here, this one is a decoy, so it just gets removed from the game. If he had picked one with a colored marker, it would just stay flipped on the board so he knows there's an actual um, detective on the case that's hunting him down. At the end of step seven, we would return to step five again, and Jack's gonna make that decision all over again, whether to wait again or to kill. Each time he waits, 
This marker moves to the left, basically giving him overall more time to get to his hideout. Um, but each time he waits, the token gets moved, and the, re the head of the investigation gets to move the pawns, and then he gets to take a, take a look at a police patrol token. But let's say he decides on the second move that he decides to kill. So we go straight to phase eight. So phase eight is a corpse on the sidewalk. Jack records on his sheet the number of the crime scene. So let's say Jack has decided to kill this wretched pawn. So it's on 27. And since we're on Roman numeral number two, he decided to kill right there. 27 would get notated in that column right there. So obviously the police now know that Jack the Ripper committed a murder at that time sequence at space 27 on the board. So now we're gonna move Jack because we know he's located there, right there where that time of the murder is. And the last and final step, step nine of the first part of the game, which is called Hell, is the alarm whistles. So you replace all the marked police patrol tokens with the corresponding pawns. Any decoy ones are removed from the game. So I'm gonna flip those over now. So I've flipped over all the black markers and for the corresponding colors, I've now replaced those with the police markers. And remember, they always exist on a black square. They move along black squares while Jack the Ripper and the Wretched Pawns move along the numbered circles. Now we're in the second part of the round, or the night, which is called hunting. The first step is performed by Jack the Ripper. He escapes in the night. So Jack is going to move along the dotted line uh, to an adjacent numbered circle. He records his location and he advances the pawn on the move track. So we know that he started in 27, where this murder took place. And so we'll actually mark that a murder took place there, and this pawn was murdered. And now he can move an to an adjacent spot. So he can move to 26, he can move to 44, he can head down this way along the dotted line to 46, he can move to 28, he can move all the way here to 29, so he can move to any adjacent numbered circle. One important restriction is he cannot move across any black square where a police patrol is, otherwise they would discover him and arrest him and he'd lose the game, so that's an illegal move. If Jack does not have a legal possible move, uh, he loses the game, he's arrested. So let's say Jack decides to travel along this black line and move to circle 48. And so unbeknownst to the other detectives, he would put 48 right there and then advance the movement marker. So I'm just advancing that. And on my pad, I recorded 48. Okay, step two of the hunting phase is now the patrolmen get to move. They get to hunt the monster. So each policeman pawn moves. So starting with the head of the investigation for the round, a policeman can move up to two crossings. Those are the black squares. They get to ignore the numbered circles. So just like Jack ignores the squares, policemen ignore the numbered circles. Each policeman can move up to two crossings, but cannot uh, end his movement on the same crossing as another policeman pawn, but they can pass through. So let's see how that would work. We know Brown's the head of the investigation, so they can move one, or they can even move two. So they'll go one, two, they ignore the white circles. They're moving closer to the scene of the crime. This blue one, maybe he just decides to move one and move there. Remember this is done in clockwise order. Moving along the dotted lines, one, two, and then this detective will move one, two. And then finally this detective maybe just moves one there. So the third and final phase um, or step during this hunting process that will repeat over and over and over are clues and suspicion. So each policeman pawn either looks for clues or executes an arrest. Uh, this is done starting with the head of the investigation for the night and then in clockwise order, each policeman pawn gets the choice they can look for clue or they can execute an arrest. So to look for a clue, basically they'll select, they'll announce the number 
of an adjacent numbered circle and if that numbered circle appears anywhere on Jack's sheet in the current knight's row, Jack places a clue marker on that numbered circle and that policeman action ends so they can look for clues. Um, if it doesn't, uh, then the detective gets to announce the number of another adjacent number circle and he can keep repeating this process until a clue marker is placed or until he's investigated all adjacent numbered circles. So let's do this example. Let's say this officer says, I'm searching for clues in 29. Well, Jack checks his sheet, and in that row, there is no 29, so he says no, there's no clues there. Then they say 28, Jack again says no, and he says, okay, I'm gonna search for clues in 48. You can see this is adjacent. For, uh, 46 is adjacent also, uh, but he says 48, and Jack says yes there is a clue there because that's on the sheet. So they'll take a clue marker and they'll simply put it on 48. And that ends that blue police tokens turn. Alternatively, instead of searching for clues, they could have announced an arrest. So just like announcing clues on an adjacent circle, they can select one and only one adjacent numbered circle and say, I'm gonna try to execute an arrest if Jack is there. So if they said 46, Jack says, no, I'm not there. It's basically the last number on his sheet, which we know was 48 from this example. He would say no, and then this police pawn's turn would end and we'd go to the next one. Now, if he got lucky and said, I'm gonna try to execute an arrest on 48, and we know Jack was on 48, he would be arrested and the game would be over. But we remember in this example, he was just searching for clues. So unless Jack has been arrested or he has safely made it to his hideout, we keep repeating this hunting phase. So Jack would go back again, he would remove, he'd record his location, and he'd advance his pawn on the move track. So let's talk about some of his special move tokens. So if he decides to use one of the carriages, he's basically hopping in a coach and moving along the streets of London. So a coach allows Jack to move two adjacent numbered circles in succession at once and he can, through, he can go through crossings or black squares containing policemen pawns. Basically, he's hiding in the coach and moving right past them. Both of the circles moved to must be recorded in separate spaces in the proper order, and then Jack's pawn on the move track is moved twice, and the token is placed so that it covers both of those spaces on the track. So let's see how that could possibly work here. So we know Jack is in 48, and so if he wants to use one of his carriage movements, we would do that, and we'd advance it twice, so he's made special movement using the carriage, and now he, we know he can go to two adjacent. So let's say he wants to really, instead of just moving to 28, he wants to get all the way to eight, or maybe even all the way to two. So he can go to two adjacent, or we know he can pass through this police pawn now, pawn. So maybe he goes from 48 to 29 to 30 using the carriage special option. So in that example, we know we've already moved him twice and I've put the carriage marker down there and I've notated on the sheet that he took two movements using the carriage, 29, and now he's currently in 30. So that's the carriage or the coach, I think it's called the coach special action. The other thing he can do is dart through an alley. So basically, um, he can cross a block of houses. He gets to move from a numbered circle on that block's perimeter to any other numbered circle on that block's perimeter. The alley token is then placed on the corresponding space on the move track. So let's say we're in a subsequent turn and he decides to dart through an alley. So we'll place that there. And then what he can do, we know he's in space 30. Space 30 is touching all of these different alleys. So he can move from 30 Let's see, he can move 30 all the way to 31. Normally he could only go to 32 as adjacent, or he can come down here to 50, but by darting through the alley, he's moving through that block and can go straight to 31. And so you'd mark 31 on the sheet right here as his next movement, and then advance the pawn and putting the token there. If and when, during the night, during the round, Jack is able to get back to his hideout, which is space 120, he can declare that he's made it safely back to his hideout and that ends the current round or the current night. And then we'd proceed 
to the next phase. So a knight will end in one of two ways. Jack safely makes it back to his hideout or the policemen arrest him. If Jack safely makes it back to his hideout at the end of the fourth night, he wins the game. Or if Jack can't get back to his hideout by the end of the time track, that's another way he'll lose the game. At the end of the night, what you're going to do is remove all the clue markers, so any of the yellow discs, you're going to remove those from the board. You're going to leave the policemen pawns in their current place. You'll remember the black markers have to go there during the next, during the next round. And then the crime scene marker, the red disc, will stay in place. Uh, you remove any special movement tokens from the time track. And then you will actually reset this then back to zero or back to the Roman numeral one. And then this goes back here for the next night. This entire sequence will then repeat itself for the next night, starting with Jack collecting special movement tokens based on the second night and then following the same procedure. One special thing to keep in mind is on the third night, Jack has to commit two murders. So let's quickly take a look at how that would work. So let's fast forward all night. Let's assume we're in the third night and Jack chooses to kill. Basically, he's gonna take two pawns on the board and he's going to murder two of those. So he's gonna place two crime scene markers one for each that he murdered, and then he's going to notate both numbers in succession on night three. So let's say he waited until this column to do the, to do the two murders. He would put the first number there, and then he would put his second number there. Basically, he committed the first murder, and he used his first movement to travel to the location of a second wretched white pawn and commit the second murder. Now because he did that, he forgoes his first step of movement on the third night and we skip straight to step two and the policemen get to move. So both those numbers would get written in succession based on uh, where he took it on the time track. Everything else works the same. So let's say he did that there, he committed the first murder and then you would move the pawn because he moved and took a second murder that's recorded on his sheet, and now the policemen act like they normally would in step two of the hunting phase. And then finally, obviously, the number that he wrote second is where he's gonna start his movement um, adjacent to that going forward. And that should be everything you need to set up and play Letters from Whitechapel.